Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, Martin. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, and that actually just says what Martin's just said, so I can move on very quickly. Uh, the key thing is that uh, I spent 35 years in industry, so you can tell that I'm not only passionate about technology and, and science, I'm also passionate about getting it out into the world so that we can, uh, we can, we can take advantage of it. So what is photonic integration? Well, it's the art and the science and the technology of combining many optical functions all connected together on a single chip connected by waveguides. And there are many materials in which this can be done. Uh, I've worked particularly with compound semiconductors like indium phosphide, where you can integrate everything from semiconductor lasers to detectors to modulators to waveguides. But there are many other technologies out there, and they have their own advantages as well. And it's very interesting now that the silicon world and the optical world are really converging. And actually fabricating on, on silicon is very exciting uh, because you know, the microelectronics industry has developed techniques for making silicon chips in, with incredible precision on huge wafers that, that, uh, with, with great yields and so on. Um, one small, small problem is that you can't actually make a laser directly on silicon, but I'll come to that in a minute. And there are other technologies there as well, and materials like graphene that have a part to play. And in fact, one of my research students, Rob Miller, has a poster on that you can go and have a look at in a minute. So this is what it's all about. It's about taking optical systems that might fill a room uh, and putting them on a single chip. And uh, this, this particular example is about uh, quantum technology. It's about implementation of quantum computing functions. So that includes things like um, uh, the generation of quantum states, uh, detection of single photons, and so on and so forth. Doesn't matter. It's it, this technology is all about taking multiple, fact multiple functions and putting them on a single chip so that we can make things which are not only really small and really robust, but also can be made very precisely with very accurate tracking, can actually uh, be very efficient because the light is confined to very small dimensions so we can control it with manageable voltages and electric fields. By putting a lot of things on one chip, we don't have to worry about how to connect many optical components together with fibers or lenses or whatever, so that's very manufacturable. And the more things that you can eliminate, the more reliable it gets. So a single chip is always going to be better, typically is much better, than uh, something which has many, many devices all connected with, with fibers or optical systems. And because we're making things on wafers uh, with scalable manufacturing techniques, photolithography, uh, then typically you know, we can make thousands of circuits on a wafer. Uh, they're all going to be pretty much the same. Uh, within very, very tight tolerances. And of course, because you're making thousands of things at once, that can be very uh, economical in, uh, in manufacture. So this is where we started out about 30 years ago at my old firm uh, based at Caswell, Northamptonshire. This was a chip for a fiber to the home terminal. Yes, we were already thinking about fiber to the home terminals uh, in the 1980s. Um, and uh, this was a bi-directional link. This is a wavelength division uh, multiplexer, a wavelength splitter. And we have here a laser. Light from the laser gets steered across. Light from uh, another wavelength coming from the other end of the link gets steered across the other way and out to an exit port. So that was a, one of the very first photonic integrated circuits ever made. This is a slightly more sophisticated one from a couple of years later. So we've now got a high speed laser, still got a WDM component, wavelength division multiplexing component. We've now got the detectors on chip and so on. And from here, it's been onwards and upwards. So whereas in the 19, circa 1990, we were putting a handful of components on a chip, now we're into the several thousands. So we can, we can, these are lasers, detectors, modulators, couplers, filters, uh, and, and so on. And this has become an absolute uh, mainstay of the communications industry. The internet of today would not exist without these, uh, without these components to generate and process the optical signals involved. 
So, what's in, I've talked to, I've alluded to these building blocks, but what are they? Well, in electronics, if you've got a transistor and a resistor and a capacitor and some way to connect them all together, you can make whatever you like, including those billion transistor ICs that Taylor had in one of his first uh, slides. Well, in optics, if you've got a way of changing the amplitude of an optical wave, its phase, its polarization, you can do everything there is to know about a, an optical wave. So these are your basic processing blocks, and if you can connect them together with waveguides, then you can make optical circuits that perform all of those available functions. And we've developed these, uh, th these, uh, these building blocks in generic uh, integration processes. This is an indium phosphide, and this example comes from Eindhoven University in the Netherlands. So we've got an optical amplifier, change the amplitude. We've got a, a, a modulator to change the phase. We've got waveguides to connect them all together. And we've got a polarization rotator to change the polarization. And so uh, these are cross sections of those waveguides. Dimensions here are typically one or two microns. This is the kind of scale that we're talking about. So with all of that, you can do whatever you like. Uh, you know, this, the limitation is the imagination <laughs> more than anything else. Um, about 15 years ago, um, I helped to found an organization called JEPIX, which is the Joint European Platform for Photonic Integrated Circuits and Systems. And uh, I'm still involved, actually, <laughs> still, still engaged. Um, but JEPIX has set up ways of fabricating these photonic ICs in a way that's available to researchers, to small companies, to larger companies. And uh, we've set up um, pilot line services in recent years. And, uh, well, to date, we've done more than 800 different photonic integrated circuit designs for different people. <clears throat> and you can see the range of applications is extremely wide, from RF circuits to optical data handling, optical switching, all kinds of lasers, medical imaging, microwave optics, sensors, uh, and quantum applications. So with those building blocks, you can really make a huge range of things, and they can really apply to a huge range of, of industries. So telecom and datacom have probably well, have certainly been the lead applications. Uh, they have, um, uh, you know, they, they have really driven the, the uh, development of photonic integration technology in companies like the one that I used to work for, Lumentum, as, as it is now. Uh, but increasingly, these, uh, the, these uh, BICs are getting into precision metrology and industrial systems, LIDAR for automotive uh, systems, medical diagnostics, agriculture, and so on and so forth. So it's a real enabler for the future of the industry, many industries. I haven't got much time, but I'd just like to give a whistle-stop tour of some of the things that are going on in the department. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to pick up with, with me and with the other members of the team afterwards, you're, of course, incredibly welcome. So, a lot of the things that we do are related to ultra-high speed systems and RF and microwave and terahertz systems. If you have two optical frequencies which are separated by a certain RF frequency, it might be 100 gigahertz, it might be a terahertz, if you then beat those signals together on a photodiode, a sufficiently fast photodiode, which by the way we've developed in the department uh, to, uh, with really world leading results in that area, then you will get that RF difference frequency out, and any processing you do in the optical domain will be translated into the RF domain. So um, various circuits here have been developed by, by the uh, cast of, of characters up the right hand there, including Martin, as a key, key researcher in, in the field. And there's just some examples, you know, for instance, in the generation of frequency combs, so this one, Ewan Tuff, just recently received his PhD, working with, with Martin and the team, uh, generating terahertz with frequency combs, with this kind of circuit here. 
And another skill that we have in the department is how to extract comb lines and lock lasers to individual comb lines so that we can get high precision in terms of the RF frequencies that are, that are generated. So in addition to that frequency comb generator, we've now got a phase lock loop uh, uh, chip taking those individual comb lines and generating very uh, high purity uh, optical uh, RF signals. Applications very wide. This is work from Ponopolum, who is using that technique of terahertz generation for remote, uh, for sensing of uh, air uh, constituents in the atmosphere, because many constituents in the atmosphere have uh, absorption lines in the terahertz region, and this is a very effective and efficient way of generating those terahertz waveforms for that, uh, that kind of sensing. Uh, I'm working with Zixin Liu, and actually in the optical networks group, to look at frequency combs for not only for communications, but also for things like medical and, and industrial imaging using interferometric techniques. And uh, this is a very ambitious chip that uh, Alex Bennett, who will also have a poster outside, uh, is developing uh, for, for that application. One thing I would like to mention, though, is that in addition to all the applications-oriented work that we're doing, working on platforms like Indian Phosphide and so on, we're developing a platform of our own, which is, I think, extremely exciting. I mentioned at the beginning that if we could fabricate everything on silicon, you know, we could be fabricating on 200, 300 millimeter wafers, you know, dinner plate sized wafers with very high yields uh, in the industrial CMOS. Uh, you know, uh, fabrication facilities. And the, problem with, the only problem with that is that, you, you know, silicon, because it doesn't have a direct band gap, is not able to generate light efficiently. So the team here, um, and the key, key researcher here is, is Huyan Liu, you see there, developed a way of growing 3.5 semiconductors, which do have a, a direct band gap and have that capability to generate light directly on silicon while maintaining high crystal quality so devices are efficient and reliable. And uh, these devices, particularly using quantum dot structures, uh, have now proved to be not only capable of making very good lasers, they're also capable of operating at very high temperatures. You've got a laser here working at 195 degrees C, which is great because you don't have to cool it, which takes power and, and, and is much more energy efficient. And this technology, um, the lovely technology, not only produces very efficient lasers, it also shows very good tolerance of the defects which you inevitably get when you fabricate on dissimilar materials. So some of the results actually there, just showing that these lasers are really, really comparable with the lasers which are grown on native materials. Uh, there's a poster outside from Christina, uh, Christina Vivian, who is looking at how now to take the next stage. And this is the key thing, which I'm very excited about and working on at the moment, how we actually extend this platform, not only to have lasers and waveguides, but also modulators, detectors, and so on, all integrated in a, a coherent platform. And uh, Christina is presently working on the task of integrating the laser with a passive waveguide. And you know, as a test vehicle, she's developing an extended cavity laser, which will have now a line width uh, and uh, uh, can be used as, as a laser in its own right, but also as a, as a test of the uh, and a step towards full integration. Not the only platform that we're working on. Uh, we're working on thin film lithium niobate, which is particularly suitable for modulators and for some quantum applications, in partnership in this case with uh, CSEM in Switzerland. Once again, another poster you can look at. And the final, final building block, the one that nobody has in a platform yet, is a one-way waveguide, one that can actually transmit in one direction and not in the other, or can route light to one port, and then the light coming back from that port goes to another one, and not straight back into the laser. So we think we've got a very uh, exciting way of doing that. We just started the European collaboration on, on, uh, on that one. So lots and lots of things going on. 
just mention that when we talk about integrated photonics, it's not only integrating optical functions, but also terahertz functions. So in here we've actually got that terahertz generator, that ultra high speed photodetector, launching light into a metamaterial waveguide to, to guide the terahertz radiation, the basis for uh, uh, optical um, terahertz sensors and so on. That's James Seddon's work. And so, a very quick whistle-stop tour, I think you've seen that photonic integration can do a huge amount. It's a key enabler for today's communication systems. That's what the company that I was with did particularly, first and foremost. But capable of, of doing so much more in all these different fields of application. When we've got the silicon photonics integrated with 3.5s, that will be extremely exciting to take this to the next stage. We have already got generic processes and open access platforms that enable us to, to, to make some very exciting circuits for all kinds of different reasons. And I think it's very likely that for integrated photonics can be as, as important in the current century as microelectronics became in the last. I just leave you with a list of all the exciting stuff that's going on in the group, uh, from 3.5 on silicon to pick platforms to non-reciprocal devices, to low power consumption devices, to co-integration with electronics and quantum technology and, and so on. If any of this is exciting for you, then do come and have a chat afterwards. With that, I'd just like to thank all the members of the team who do fantastic work and my colleagues elsewhere as well. And thank you for listening. Okay, thanks very much, Mike. Um, again, just, one, just time for one quick question, if anyone has one for Mike. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering for the device, some of the devices you mentioned, particularly the terahertz spectrometer and frequency comb, what is the output power level compared to other conventional sources? I think it's actually very comparable, and you have, or you know, perhaps even in some cases higher, um, it also gives you, of course, the capability of doing processing on the way. Uh, but uh, actually, I should probably bounce this one to Martin, because Martin is actually a key researcher on the terahertz program that we have at the moment. So <laughs> I, I, I was to, afraid uh, you were going to... Add your comments. I was afraid you were going to do that. Um, <laughs> I, I think, yes, you're, you're generally, uh, your comment is, is generally true. I mean, it depends on... We, when we talk about terahertz, we, we, we're quite loose in our definition. So anything above 100 gigahertz is terahertz. Um, and it very much depends in that where in that region that you're, you're working. Um, photonic techniques can, let's say 300 gigahertz, can generate a milliwatt of, of power, but it's at that sort of level. But that's comparable to, to the same performance at, um, from electronics at that frequency. Uh, if you go to a terahertz or, or, or so, because you just tune the lasers further apart, um, Th then you, you get less power out, out of a photodiode, but it's difficult to generate power in that region anyway. It's uh, the so-called so terahertz gap before you get to a few, few terahertz where you can use things like quantum cascade lasers, which are much higher power. So in terms of doing work, and in particularly in terms of doing terahertz communications, uh, generating power in the hundreds of gigahertz region is still very much of an issue. Uh, okay, so um, I think we'll draw the session to a close there. Um, if you've enjoyed this session, uh, there'll be another one uh, in this room at, starting at 3 o'clock with three different speakers. And in the meantime, one of the reasons why I've been hassling the, the, all the speakers to keep to time is that there's lots of other things for you to see. In particular, I encourage you to go and visit the posters uh, of all our wonderful PhD students who are outside eagerly waiting to talk to you. So um, to close the session, perhaps we can just thank the speakers one more time and then you can go up and have a look at some other things. <laughs> <laughs>